This is Jimmy Powers, ready to bring you another story from The Tumult and the Shouting. Hi there, this is Jimmy Powers, transcribed, coming your way once again with another chapter from the Grantland Rice story, The Tumult and the Shouting. So with a bow to Granny, I'll pick up his narration in first person. This one I titled McGraw, Mack, McCarthy, and others. Of all the big league baseball managers I have known most intimately, perhaps John McGraw of the Giants, Connie Mack of the Athletics, and Joe McCarthy of the Yankees lead the list. They won a total of 27 pennants. McGraw, 10, Mack, 9, and McCarthy, 8. The first manager I ever knew was Newt Fisher, owner and manager of Nashville's Southern League team. In 1901, he offered me $250 a month to play shortstop for Nashville when the best job outside of this was $5 a week. I had to pass up the juicy offer because I had broken my right shoulder blade and right collarbone playing football the previous fall. The throwing arm was about done. McGraw, Mack, and McCarthy were totally unlike in every way. I met McGraw and Mack in the same year, 1905, when I came up from Atlanta to cover the World Series in which Christy Mathewson pitched three shutouts in six days. McGraw, a bantam rooster, a fiery leader, was always in active charge on the field and off. He was the umpire's foe and the foe of every team he played. He courted dislike in various cities, for he was shrewd enough to realize that additional fans would come out to see the hated Giants beaten. He would get all the dope and gossip about umpires and then spill it on the field in the arguments that always arose. But I soon found that he was a friendly man with many close pals. It was on my first trip with the Giants in 1911 after I had moved to New York. We were traveling on an off day. I was trying to figure out a piece to write for the mail. I was in a Pullman seat pecking away when to my surprise McGraw moved in with me. What are you writing about today, he asked. I told him I hadn't yet uh, stumbled on anything worth writing the paper. I've got a story for you, he said. Together we worked out a good yarn. After that we were always good friends. I'll admit he used to get a bit peeved at me for lugging off Mathewson, Merkel, and Donlan to play golf, especially one Sunday in Pittsburgh. Matty seldom pitched on Sunday. It was a hot day, and Matty insisted on playing 36 holes. We both staggered in exhausted. Matty had won 11 straight games at that time. But McGraw pitched him Monday, and he was knocked out of the box in the fourth inning. I hid out from McGraw for four days. We were both in the doghouse. McGraw never liked golf, that is, during the baseball season. One night when the Giants were going badly, McGraw invited me to his room. Other writers were present, and also five players who had gone sour. McGraw served a dinner that included champagne. The five ball players became mellow, if not downright stiff. The tension was over. Next day, they hammered the hide off the ball. Their slump was finished. Most managers would have ordered just the opposite cure. Connie Mack was quite different. Even Rube Waddell rarely upset Connie, a quiet man who was rarely excited. He would turn over many problems to the team. If a player was loafing, drinking, or cutting up, Mack would let his players handle the offender. 
Headed by Eddie Collins, they quickly realigned the offending player or had him fired. Nobody could handle Waddell. He would take a few days off and tend bar, or he would go fishing for three or four days. Once the rube bought a mockingbird that had lived by a peanut vendor's loud whistle. All the bird would imitate was this whistle. The team got little sleep until someone strangled the feathered Johnny One Note. I was talking with Connie about the great rube. He had the greatest combination of speed and a deep, fast-breaking curve I ever saw, Connie said. He almost had Johnson's speed, but Johnson hasn't his curve, nor has anyone else. I recall a game in Cleveland when Waddell was pitching. He came to the park with a well-painted lady of the town on each arm and planted them in a box back of home plate near the press box. Waddell had the game in hand, one to nothing in the ninth, when Cleveland filled the bases with none out. Lajouet, Flick, and Bradley, three great hitters, were coming up. Waddell walked in from the pitcher's box to the box containing his lady friends. Connie looked on in astonishment. Lifting his cap and making a deep bow, the rube said, Ladies, I'll be with you in just a minute. In that minute, or nearly so, he struck out Lajouet, Flick, and Bradley on nine pitched balls. Joe McCarthy, like Mack and McGraw, had one striking feature. He had the deepest respect for the players. One day at St. Petersburg, I was playing golf with Bill Dickey, Joe Gordon, and King Kong Charlie Keller, three great players. We had a tough, close match. We came to the 16th tee practically even. Somebody asked the time. It's 12.40, I remarked. Gordon said, the battle is over. McCarthy told us to meet him at 1.20 today. What's the trouble, I asked. A few minutes won't make any big difference. It does with McCarthy, Dickey said. One minute makes a real big difference. The winner of eight pennants, McCarthy was a quiet, dignified man who rarely got into an argument. He never liked ball players cutting capers around the hotel lobby or in any public place. You are a Yankee now, he would say. He was on the inconspicuous side himself, and he wanted his Yankees to be the same way. Remember, you're a Yankee, had a sobering, soothing influence on his band. Joe McCarthy knew his business thoroughly. One day, I asked Bill Dickey, an old and close friend, about McCarthy's ability. He is one of the best, Grant, Bill said. He knows his job from every angle. He's the boss, and we know it. His judgment in handling pitchers is exceptional. There's nothing phony about Joe. He runs this club from top to bottom. No favorites. They talk about a push-button manager. That's crazy. He's a great manager. He doesn't like show-offs or pop-offs. I recall one star ball player McCarthy had who was getting out of hand. He was hitting 350, and in addition was a brilliant fielder. McCarthy gave him an order one day, which the player disregarded. McCarthy called him to his office after the game. You're a great ball player, he said quietly. You are young and fast, and you can hit. I'll miss you on this club, for you are leaving us tonight. Report tomorrow to so-and-so. The star was dazed. McCarthy stuck out his hand. Goodbye and good luck, kid, Joe said, and take a tumble to yourself. Don't be quite so smart. McGraw, Mack, and McCarthy, they loved the old game with the deepest devotion. They wanted it played to the hilt. They got results in different ways, but they got results. The answer is 27 pennants. It was not until 1949 that Casey Stengel arrived in the vicinity of New York. I had known Casey when he played with the Giants, and when he managed the Dodgers and the Braves, but only casually. When he finally landed at the head of the Yankees, he came with a rush and a roar, something like a continued explosion. He won five successive pennants and five World Series, an all-time big league record for pennants and World Series. I rode west with him just after he had signed his first Yankee contract in December 1948. His previous managerial experience had been slightly on the melancholy side. I wonder how things will be next season, he said where I'll be a year from now. A remarkable person, Casey is a close student of psychology. In the spring of 1953 at St. Petersburg, I was standing with him during practice. He happened to look around and spotted six or seven forlorn-looking rookies sitting together. Come along, he said, grabbing my arm. He walked over to the rookies, kids from 19 to 21, and told them he wanted to see them inside the clubhouse. We all went along. Casey had Cokes served. He told several stories. There wasn't a point to any story he told. 
All were gibberish, but those kids began laughing. 15 or 20 minutes later, we started back to the field. These kids were just homesick, said Case. They're all right now, and they were. Casey will protest violently and bitterly at times, but not too often. He never took on the field the vitriolic quality that Stamp McGraw and typifies Leo DeRocher, who, in my opinion, is a shrewd, able field leader. Managers I've known and admired include Lou Budrow of the Indians and the Red Sox, and now the Kansas City Athletics, Frank Chance of the Cubs, Bill McKechnie of many teams, a great fellow and an able team director, George Stallings of the 1914 Braves, a forceful, fiery manager, and Frankie Frisch, also of many teams. Frisch, one of the great second basemen, is also one of the top men I've met in baseball. The game has known only one Frisch. Years ago, when Charlie Dryden, the famous baseball writer, was introduced to Frisch, Dryden remarked, sounds like something frying. Frankie always was sizzling for battle. Miller Huggins was also a great manager. He won six or seven pennants. Huggins had a tough crew to handle, headed by young Babe Ruth. He got Babe when he was just emerging as a star. In Ruth, Miller had two tigers by their tails, for Babe would accept a $5,000 fine and a long suspension with a grin. Well, that does it for today. This is Jimmy Powers transcribed and hoping you'll be with us next time. Until then, hasta la vista.